Welcome to Equipping Leaders, a podcast where I share tools and perspectives to equip leaders in self-development and team connection. I am your host, Natasha, and I am excited to share today's episode with you. Today's episode is a conversation with Sharice Kral, an executive coach and facilitator on leadership lessons, ongoing leader development, and running multiple businesses. Sharice is a phenomenal person to chat with because she can talk about all aspects of leadership and coaching, and I'm always inspired by how our conversations go. Hello, Sharice. I'm so excited to talk with you today. Could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Yeah, thanks, Natasha, for having me on. This is really exciting, and it's been so long since we've been able to talk that I've been extremely looking forward to this. <laughs> and so just a real quickly, a little bit about me. I'm a serialpreneur, so I own a few different companies. I love what I do in every single one of them, but my oldest and my favorite, it will always be my baby, is my leadership development company. And what I've been doing lately, the newest kind of project I've been working on is merging a lot of the leadership development information, that knowledge, into my business strategies company, along with my new training with Robbins Madonna's training and all of the psychotherapy and behind strategic intervention coaching, putting all of that into working with entrepreneurs and people that want to change the world or change their version of the world, right? Their, their area of the world. And as you probably know very well, Leadership is not just for bosses or just for people that want to have followers. It's for entrepreneurs as well, or people that want to make a difference because all it is, is leadership and influence, right? It works really well. That is such a wonderful perspective because I always say that leadership is all around us, right? So we don't necessarily have to be leading people. That's a big part of it. And that is a huge chunk of what we consider to be leadership. But people also lead processes, they lead projects, and they lead people through those. So when you can find that leadership in those spaces and just have those basic skills, exactly. it makes your project better. It makes everybody better. Mm -hmm. There's not one way to lead people. There are many different facets of being able to do that. Absolutely. So what is your leadership origin story? Oh goodness, <laughs> that's always a good one, especially when I'm talking to another fellow veteran. So <laughs> I started off in leadership development because I had joined the army when I was 18. And I thought like every other civilian that the army had amazing leadership. And so <laughs> I know, I love how you laugh at that. I found out very quickly, uh, the first couple years I was in, that that is not the case. All of our leadership training is actually management training. And this is how you lead a squad, or this is how you write out a, a risk assessment form, you know, just all managerial stuff. And that's not what great leaders do. And because of that, back when I was in, I saw the results of that. and all of these really bad leaders were getting all of this leadership training and getting promoted and being put into leadership positions that completely and utterly affected people's livelihoods and sometimes their lives. And I saw that affect my career. I saw that affect uh, my battle buddies' careers all negatively. And realistically, maybe 10% of People in authoritarian positions in the military were great leaders, maybe 10%. I think I was in five or six different units, lost track. Maybe two of those I loved. <laughs> and because it was, it was because the leadership was actually good in those. And so after a couple of years of being in the military, I had a hard time dealing with that because of my childhood and needing to have things done correctly and needing to have justice in the world after a bad childhood. It was really hard for me to be in the military, a place where I thought that I would get that from and not have it. And one day, one of our warrant officers, one of our pilots, because I was in an aviation unit, handed me a John Maxwell book. And it was uh, De Developing the Leader Within You 1.0. <laughs> <laughs> and and after I read that, the rest was history. I got so obsessed with leadership development. I started working with a couple of Inc. Magazine's top 50 leadership experts. And then eventually I got around to getting certified with John Maxwell and just loved every minute of it. 
It was, it was the answer to every question and every issue I was having. You said so many things in there that I absolutely loved. <laughs> <laughs> so first, I, I think it's such an important point to bring up that you manage tasks and you lead people, right? Where it's like, there are these things that need to be done and these tasks are very important. But me knowing how to submit an award is not more important than creating a psychologically safe environment where people can come to me if there's a problem. Yeah. yeah. And in the military specifically, inspiration is, is very few and far between. And you can't have innovation and creativity and all of these great results in a team or in a, in a goal if you don't have inspiration first. And when you don't have good leaders, you can't have good inspiration because bad leaders, what do they do? They, they overwhelm, they control, <laughs> they force people to do stuff. That sounds a lot like the military, right? <laughs> I should have known better. <laughs> well, it's such a great point that, yeah, when you look at it from the outside, the way that it is advertised is very, we've got this locked down. We, we know how to do this and on paper, having been out and gone back and just kind of looked at their leadership, you know, regulation on paper, this looks great. This looks really great. And then as you realize that they're trying to meet numbers and a metric and just kind of pushing people through this, where it's like, I think they fall into that. If you can do these technical tasks or these specific tasks, that makes you a good leader. Oh, you're a fast runner. You're a good leader. Oh, you're really good at this job. You're a good leader. And there is no evidence that says that being a great technician makes you a good leader at all. You can be, but there's no evidence that says those two things correlate. Right, it's not synonymous at all. The other piece I really loved about what you said was that self-awareness of realizing that why the military wasn't working for you, right? Where it's like, it works for many people and you know, thank them for their service, totally. And there is this element of knowing that this isn't working and I feel like I'm fighting against this system and I'm frustrated and annoyed all the time. That was my experience too. Uh, and then it was like, but why? So instead of it just being like, oh, oh the army, they are, you know, this service is bad. It's like, no, I need these different things. And it's just like a values mismatch where it just, it's, it's just, it's not working out. And honestly, the sad case of it is when you don't have leadership, good leadership, you create toxic environments so easily because that's the opposite and you can't be neutral. You're either doing badly or doing well, one of the two. There's no such thing as neutrality with leadership, I don't believe, because it's always a right and wrong decision. And human beings, we're always in a gray area. And so I'm not saying that everything you deal with is going to have just two answers, but with communication, you can be helping the, the situation and building the relationship or you can be hurting it. And that's something that I've realized not only in the army, but also in so many jobs that you, I was working at a police station once, I was working at a recruiting station once, and all of these different places had such toxic environments simply because of the leadership. That was the only thing that was keeping them from being an incredible place to work. And it's tough because you see all the people around you at the lower levels suffering from that. And I know we'll probably get into it a little bit, but you know, leadership, you, you can be the leader at the lowest level. You don't have to be the one in authority, but a lot of these very controlling and systematic environments like the military or like police departments, it's harder to do that because you get to a point, if somebody's closed-minded and they're above you, you get to a point where you have to listen to them because of their rank. You have to respect the rank. And it's tough to create great leadership from the ground up in environments like that. So it's even more important in those situations. I love that you brought that up because it was something that was also kind of just percolating in my mind where something that I saw was people were also so, I mean, it's a total institution. People were so institutionalized within it too, that you're right, as soon as it got to a certain place or they had this like, you know, go get along to go along mentality. And it was almost like even trying to lead at lower levels, there is such a system and such a culture that you just comply with the system that this kind of like innovative or different type of thinking, or even like, 
hey, let's like maybe take some respect for the humanity of this, that it's the first day of school. That's super stressful for all these parents. Let's do something. You know, let's not make that the first day we start all this intense training or just something like that. And it just the system, even people who are maybe open to that, it just didn't allow for that kind of openness in those sort of changes. Right. And quite often because humans are, and I won't say the correct term for this, but essentially we're herd animals. We have to be together and we have cliques and we have cultures and all these different things uh, naturally as human beings that when you get into an organization where the quote unquote right thing is a toxic personality or going along with that, it can be almost impossible to go against it. And in the military, we call that being a blue falcon, right? Doing the opposite of everybody else. And we get down on people so much about it because it kills people, which is true. I mean, we did that a lot, just being in the culture, the community, you know, the community. I remember just as a quick example that I would work on the helicopter and I'd be the first one out there and I'd do what I could and, and get done as much as I could. But because of that, I was always the first one done. And so I'm, I hate sitting around. I hate being lazy. There's a difference between strategic laziness and, and just being traditionally lazy. And, and so there's a very big difference. One of them is healthy and one of them is not. And so when you're sitting there in uniform and you have so many hours in the day when you're not deployed, you have so many hours in the day that you're working, you don't want to sit around and waste those hours. You want to be a good soldier. You want to be there to do things that make a difference and that matter. And so instead of sitting around with everybody else doing nothing, waiting for orders, I would go and pick up all the trash cans because we were going to do have to do that in a couple hours anyway. Or I would reorganize a really messy toolbox or something like that. I would do something that's valuable. And because of that, in almost every unit, I was treated like the Blue Falcon. I was speed up verbally all the time about it. I would get called into offices because of it. They would say that I was the one being lazy or I was trying to avoid work just because I wasn't with everybody else. And so many different, just completely arrogant and bias and ignorant viewpoints, you know, from what I was actually doing versus what they were claiming I was doing purely because I wasn't doing the same thing as everybody else. That's what it came down to. Yes, I had many similar type experiences where, yeah, they definitely want to put a stigma on you just to make sure that you know your place, quote unquote, or whatever the unit wants to, how they kind of want to identify that, but absolutely. I understand the positives of, of why they had that type of culture. It just would go way beyond being healthy in a community because they didn't have that balance point of great leadership to combat it or to keep it from going too far. Yes. Absolutely. When I think of, there was one in particular, one really great leader that I had in the military and he could have asked for anything and we would have done it, right? It would have been no big deal to just hang out and wait for whatever was next. Now, he also would never do that to us, right? He was never, he was very much aware of the need for people's differences, that diversity of thoughts, that diversity of experience, and you know, how people needed to navigate. But it was just really interesting because when I compare that to most other leadership that was in the military, for me, it's very, it would take a lot for other people to get me to do something, right? So it was just that uh, influence that one person had was just really remarkable. Even when I think back now, I'm like, he could call me today. And I'd be like, where do you need me to be? Ah, oh, I love that. That's the attitude or the result of being a great leader. In your opinion, what is the best thing about leadership? It's funny because after all of these years of working in, in this industry, I've never been asked that question not one single time. Isn't that just insane? So <laughs> I have to think about it for a second, but honestly, the best thing about leadership is that result. It's the ability to not only inspire people to get to that goal, which is the whole reason we have leadership, but it's the after effect and the ripple effect. That's what I love the most personally, because you can do one thing for somebody and five years later, you can see that they have done that five more times or 10 more times to other people just because they saw you do it. And I see myself doing that and passing down that information 
from my mentors. And so it's, it's really exciting to see that if you're consciously looking because you can tell when it's going to turn into a legacy. And when leadership in general, that type of skill set and that art turns into a legacy, it's the best outcome because that many lives are affected. And honestly, if we don't have a purpose that focuses on affecting people's lives positively, then what are we doing? <laughs> I mean, what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's a, yes, that, that impact, how are we, how, how is it landing on other people? I facilitate these leadership workshops and something happened in a session a while back where they were in breakout rooms and they were practicing one-on-one, -on -one giving each other feedback using, you know, a structure that we gave them. And when they came back, you know, I asked, you know, how did that go? What did you like? You know, how did it feel? And one of the people, they said, you know, I was working with this person and I felt comfortable and I felt safe the whole time. This was our first time meeting and I want to make other people feel the way that he made me feel. And I just love that because I was like in that moment, like him acknowledging this other person and being like, oh, this impact is big. I feel this and I, I want someone else to feel that too. I just love that. He remembered that and, and made a statement about it in a large group of people mm -hmm. to call that person out in a really positive way. So that's fantastic. And that's a skill set in itself with leadership, praise in, in public and criticize in private, right? So there are great things, of course, about leadership and there are also challenges. What has been the most challenging thing for you about leadership? Two things are equally challenging for me. One is coming from the outside and one is coming from the inside. Coming from the inside, we all know that the hardest person to lead is yourself. And a lot of the, our Robbins Madonna's training that I've been going through and changing these subconscious patterns and habits that we create has helped me a lot with that. It's almost kind of like the other piece, the missing puzzle piece to doing that because we can't just consciously tell ourselves, you need to wake up at eight o'clock in the morning and you need to make your bed every day. We can begrudgingly do that if somebody else is in our face, right? But if we don't have a reason to do it and we don't have a big enough emotional response to that reason, then that habit, that morning daily habit that we do when we're half asleep is not going to happen every single day. And it's going to very quickly die away, just like almost everybody's New Year's resolutions because <laughs> they aren't creating lasting change. And so that's been a very difficult aspect for me up until recently when I finally started learning how to create lasting change in a psychotherapy realm and actually using the neuroscience behind it to create a very solid pattern for myself. You have to intentionally do it, you know? <laughs> And I'm one of those people that doesn't like to do that kind of stuff, even if I know it. <laughs> so I'm still working at it, okay? <laughs> but it has changed my life drastically, especially with leadership. The other aspect from the outside coming in is that traditionally, so backing up just a hair, leadership is a relatively new industry. It's always been around, but it was not coined uh, as leadership and the skill sets and the influence and all of these different things that make up what we say nowadays as a great leader wasn't actually put under that umbrella of leadership until I think 1940 maybe it was fairly new and since then I mean we're growing through all of Rockefeller and all of these different great male leaders I think you know where I'm getting at it's always been men in leadership and leadership equals what what title you have it was always those two things and that's still seen prevalently today in our culture because it takes a very long time to change a culture it takes multiple 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 generations i think it takes about on average 100 years or 150 years to get something out of a culture system to change it and that's if it's actively being focused on as a culture you know, the mass audience or the leadership within that culture is focusing on changing audience point of view. And so today it's still very difficult for women to be seen as leaders. Yes, it's definitely being worked on. There's a lot of changes and every year there's more changes. And 
The problem is, is that we still see it the other way. So we have to consciously fix that thought process. It's not a subconscious thing yet. And it, so we'll always, our first thoughts, even us as female leaders, we still go through this. Uh, yesterday, for example, I saw a LinkedIn post of the Finnish prime minister. It was a video and you saw her walking up and handing her bag to somebody and they were talking about the Finnish prime minister and it didn't even dawn on me that they were talking about her even though she was the one in the video because she looks so much like the secretary or somebody like that and i thought for sure that it was going to pan over to the finnish prime minister but then after i watched the video a little bit longer i realized oh she is in fact the finnish prime minister and she looks my age <laughs> you know like there's no way this is even going on today i was shocked but that's a bias that's inside of me, even though I have been a leadership expert for 12 years. And I know that people are going to hate me for this, but the statistics say the truth is, is that women are naturally better leaders than men because having that empathy and those types of emotions, we get our entire lives to, to train those muscles and work on them and they're natural for us. Whereas men are very emotional creatures as well. They're actually a little bit more emotional than us, but they don't have the opportunity to train those muscles and build them up. They're told to do the opposite. They're forced to suppress those. And so it takes them a lot longer to become great leaders and to use those those muscles, these emotional muscles. And so for me, it's just from the outside looking in, it's tough to deal with that, that type of bias, but it's also from the inside, I have it too, <laughs> you know what I mean? And we all have it a little bit. And so it's something that I, I kick myself for because I'm like, oh, I need to work on this more, right? <laughs> and I'll, I'll stop there before we get on another rabbit hole. But those are really the two big things was from the outside and from the inside, what has been a struggle for me. Again, I have so many thoughts. I love it. <laughs> I'll address the outside one first. And yes, when with men, it taken them longer. I think it's because they've, they've done this society, not just men. Society has done this really great job of rebranding men's emotions, right? And not calling them that. They have a bad day. There was, the, it, but it's like, no, he was angry. He was upset. And right. Yeah. Well, and yeah. anger isn't emotion, remember? <laughs> <laughs> the anger is okay because it's not an actual emotion. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and then I remember there was an HBR article and it was about why are there so many incompetent male leaders? Mm. And that was the whole thing. And it was a catchy title. Let's read this. But the reasons that you're saying is that, you know, obviously with females, just that being able to lean into that empathy more, it being acknowledged more. But also he brought up this really great point. We don't just need better male leaders. We need better leaders in general. Yes. He said, but women do tend to be better leaders because they have to be. They have to meet every requirement. They have to meet, it's like they have to be able to do all of the things. Yeah. So even if you look at like big organizations where you have like somebody who's like a CEO, who's maybe a male, and then you have somebody who's the COO and you're like, but if you look at like their trajectory, the things that she had to do to be in that position and the roles she had to take and how many people and how many departments had to fall under her for her to even be subordinate in that position, very different. She like I think what, five times lot. more than the average male? We have to do five times more just to be at the same level or even underneath still. And it's kind of a double-edged sword for us, right? So we have this ability to increase our leadership skills by using emotions because our culture allows us to be emotional. So we have the opportunity to grow this, which is a leg up essentially. But then as soon as we get into that position, we're called emotional and we're called, like they're retreated as, a, as being a bad thing because that idea of what leadership is still hasn't fully adjusted either. Absolutely. And then when you mentioned the kind of the inside part of the challenge with creating lasting change, I'm not asking you to give away the secret sauce. <laughs> I know people can reach out to you for that. Can you uh, give us some more insight around that process or maybe some of the thinking traps you fell into that you were able to kind of work out of to help create that lasting change? 
Yeah, and I'm not even an expert in this area yet. I've been certified, but that doesn't mean that I had, don't have a lot more to learn. This is definitely a lifelong learning piece of life, just like leadership development is. But I'm sure you know there will be other people that can explain this better, but it's interesting because creating lasting change versus just trying to change, it involves a few steps that we would never naturally think of. And before I tell you a little bit more about it, I want to preface this by saying, I tested this on my dog and it totally worked. <laughs> so it's not just- Inter Yeah, uh, transcends <laughs> even species. I love it. <laughs> yep. And, and after I trained horses for many years, just because I was homeschooled, had the opportunity and it was just one of my biggest hobbies for many years until I you know, started getting deployed and all of that. And if you look at, horse training, even I would say all types of horse training, but I favor the natural horsemanship much more because it's the, it's actually just like the difference between leadership development being influential versus leadership development being situational or, or authoritarian, right? And so <laughs> um, horse training is the exact same way. We have people who break horses through force and you have people who influence horses' decisions and give them the opportunity, inspire them to learn. It's insane how similar it is. Um, <laughs> it's probably why I love it so much, but um, I, I probably could put together, honestly, an entire course teaching leadership development in an arena with a horse. I could do that completely. That being said, it works. This works on dogs and on horses. <laughs> so, and usually, the first step with with changing or making a lasting change is that you have to make an unwavering decision, and that comes from you know a lot of times we have uh, our life flash before our eyes, or we feel like we're gonna die from heartbreak because someone breaks up with us or divorces us because we suck, because we haven't made these changes. We have to have a very real and serious reason. And I said, it has to be, has to have very strong emotions connected to that reason for you to make that decision to change. And you can create that within yourself. We have these methods and these really cool strategies on bringing out emotions and this is actually works really well with actors is if you learn how to use the muscles of emotions then you can learn to bring them to the surface when you choose to which also helps you control them with reactions but if you learn how to bring positive emotions forward when you want to start creating a new habit or a new pattern that's positive so for example if i wanted to well, let's go back to making our bed. If I wanted to consistently make my bed every morning, which I don't, so I haven't worked on this, <laughs> just to preface that. Uh, if I wanted to consistently make my bed every morning, I would go through the strategies to bring the emotions, very, very positive emotions on the goal of why. And I would think about how amazing it feels and that control I would have and that peace I would have with making my bed and maybe some results of that, how much better that those emotions would carry me on through the day to create success and potential. And, and there's even a whole book around this, right? That positive part. And then I would also intentionally go into the deepest, darkest, negative emotions that I possibly can. And I would think about not making my bed. And this is just an example. You could do this with different things, but I would think about uh, or I should say this is what, what would work for me specifically is thinking about how not making my bed is a very visual analogy for my life being a total disaster or a mess or depression or anxiety or all these negative and horrible feelings and horrible lifestyles that I could create. And so I would intentionally bring those memories to this or those emotions to the surface when thinking about a messy bed. And then it goes on and on and on, but you have to be able to, to utilize emotions consciously with those different thought processes just to take that first step into making a lasting change, into making that decision to change. And once you finally decided to change, which can happen in a moment, you know, depending on what happens to us, you know, whether we our car goes off a cliff and somehow we survive and we just suddenly decide to change our life, that kind of thing, it can happen in a moment, that decision. 
but to do it intentionally, you have to recreate the physiology behind it. And so that's the next step is emotions are physiological, but so is moving. And so, uh, for example, if you if you were thinking about somebody who's depressed and anxious and can't find a job and has medical conditions and has just a really crappy life, how do you think they would sit in a chair? What what would their body be doing? Where would their head be? Would their shoulders be kind of slunched over? Would their eyes probably not, you know, be looking down? They wouldn't want to look at anybody. Would the energy level be really low? Yeah. And so their their body physically takes on the emotions they're feeling. But then you think about somebody like, let's say, uh, Elon Musk, like a billionaire out there or somebody. And I don't know if he does this, but just as an example, think of him being successful and always thinking about how he can change the life for what he believes is the better. And think about how he might sit in a chair. He probably has his shoulders back and his chest out and his head up and he's excited he's probably smiling or at least his eyes are smiling especially if he thinks of some new innovation that he could potentially you know put into place or uh, the answer to solve a problem and so his physiology how his body is is very different than somebody who's not succeeding and you're gonna probably i hope that you listen to this and then you start paying attention to your body when you're not feeling good versus when you're feeling on top of the world. And you can recreate those emotions intentionally by putting yourself into memories and focusing on these moments where you felt like you were on top of the world. A big one for me is this, the moment I graduated basic training. I'd never done anything harder in my life. And I remember after a 13 mile ruck march, um, not sleeping that night at all, I stood in formation and they finally told us that we were officially soldiers. And I remember thinking that I was literally 10 feet tall. I couldn't have pushed my shoulders back farther and I was intentionally trying to, and I was so tired. But at that moment in time, I didn't feel like I was tired at all. I felt like I had so much energy and I was so freaking excited. And all that is, is because of the, the emotions, right? That I had attached to that moment. And so physiology and emotions go hand in hand, which means if you change your physiology, then you can change your emotions as well. And this is something I don't, I don't care or know if any of you um, don't like Tony Robbins or not, but he's taught this particular skill set for about 40 years. And just a couple of years ago, Harvard Business did finally did a study on it and proved what he was saying was true that if you put yourself into a power pose for two minutes, your entire emotional structure changes, your mindset changes, that cloudy mindset that you have will go away. You'll be uh, inspired, you'll be hopeful, you'll be excited. And all that backstory comes to a question I have is, if you did that, and if you were in that, that peak state versus not, do you think you would make better decisions? Probably, right? Do you think that those those emotional structures that we create, those emotional patterns that we create to making a bed, feeling like like a, making a bed is an analogy, a direct analogy for being successful and you emotionally connect the two and you use those steps to do that. You think that every time you woke up in the morning and saw your messy bed, you would want to fix it? Probably so, right? <laughs> And that's what, what puts things into our subconscious and our subconscious creates our life because over 90% of what we do every day is ran by our subconscious. We are not actually in control of each of our days. We're in control of the habits that we have created and told the subconscious to carry out. So how you brush your teeth. I pick up my toothpaste with my left hand in the top drawer of the right hand side of the sink instead of with my right hand for some reason because that's what the pattern that i've created and i do that half asleep every single morning <laughs> you know and so we all have that and that's why it's difficult to make lasting change but it's also why it's incredibly exciting that we can do that <laughs> i absolutely love that one more thing i'll say leading back into leadership development a lot of leaders especially if you're a leadership coach you have seen clients or other leaders who have 
limiting beliefs or limiting factors to their leadership. So you can see why now I've been merging the two in my companies because if I can use that to break through those limiting beliefs and break through those subconscious patterns that are not helping their leadership, these people can become phenomenally better leaders. When I always would get stuck with clients at a certain point beforehand because I understood leadership development, but I didn't understand the subconscious patterns that create success in every aspect of life, even in that industry. It's like I finally have found a way to continue helping people past that point where as before I, I never could. And that's the thing I love the most about it. And that leads perfectly into my next question for you, Great, <laughs> which is I know that you love leadership and entrepreneurship. And like you said, you're a serialpreneur. What draws you to starting a new business? And can you kind of overlay that specifically with the different businesses that you have started and run? Yeah, so it's funny because hey, when I was nine or 10 years old, I thought that I created a business. So it's always been in my blood. <laughs> that doesn't mean that you have to uh, have that kind of story just to be an entrepreneur or business owner. But I remember I was, I was I grew up in the middle of the woods on a lake and we had a little creek running down the side of our four or five acres. And I had this kayak and I would put our little neighbor kids into the kayak and push them down the creek and make my older brother run through these ferns that we had growing on either side of the creek and in the woods um, and pretend to be dinosaurs and make all of these noises and stuff. And then I would do like a commentary of this entire Jurassic Park River adventure <laughs> for our little neighbor kids. I demanded that my mother help me like set this up, but like, I thought for sure, because I had three rocks that looked like dinosaur eggs and all this other stuff, that I would get a line all the way down our like two mile long driveway just to go on this river adventure. I, I could have swore at that age that that was going to happen, which of course it didn't, but <laughs> um, so entrepreneurship has, has always been something I've thought of. I just didn't realize it. And when I started my leadership development company, I did it because my mentors told me to. And so it wasn't really something I had thought about doing. I, I, I'm a great follower. That's probably why I did so well in the military is because I'm really good at taking directions and I want to do well. I want to be recognized for things and, and have somebody look up to me or have somebody I'm looking up to say that I've done a good job. And <clears throat> and that could get into a, a completely different story about our basic human needs. But at that point in time, when I started my leadership company, it was because of that. It was because somebody I truly respected and they had a lot of influence over me told me this was the next step or suggested it. And so I started it. And the next company that I started was completely by accident is because I was doing so well in my leadership development company and I had successfully transitioned into the online world and had a great hybrid business. I had many, many, many friends and acquaintances and, and network people coming up to me and asking me to help them because they were struggling and suffering trying to do the same thing. And so that's how I accidentally created the business strategies company. Cause I had to have somewhere to put all of that revenue. <laughs> so it was all legal and everything. <laughs> and so um, <laughs> it, was, it was a complete accident. I never wanted to do it. I'm not actually, I love business and I'm amazing at being able to find ways to create revenue. Uh, just today I was on LinkedIn and somebody made a comment on my post and I was like, oh, it sounds like you have a lot of experience in this area. And he goes, yeah, blah, 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 blah. He, and he wrote out something specific that he did well. And I said, that's incredible. Have you ever thought about doing a workshop for that? Because I know a hundred people already that would love to come to that workshop, including myself. You know, it was to, to learn better content writing. And, and he goes, oh, I never thought about that. That's a great idea. I was like, yeah, well, good luck. <laughs> Can't wait to see it. But that's what I do in my business strategies company is sit down and analyze what people are amazing at and then what people aren't good at and help build a business for them that goes in line with their passions and what they are. And then offload the stuff that they're not good at 
in a way where the business can afford it without adding more time on for them. You know, being able to leverage time, being able to create passive income, recurring income, all these things are so important. And you see nine, I should say like nine times out of 50 coaches specifically only focus on one revenue stream. They only focus on one offer, coaching people. And not only is that creating a very dangerous business, there's no hedging at all, but it also takes up all of their time, completely limits the amount of money they make. And it, honest, and they can get satiated. They can get bored or sick of what they do. <laughs> so so I, I love being able to help them find those other offers and build them out or help them build them out and, and give them that leverage and all of the different revenue streams coming in because I'm good at it, because I like it. But I would never have decided to do that at all. <laughs> that was not a passion of mine, but we always like what we're good at. And, and so it ended up turning into something like that. <laughs> yes. yes, well, and I really love the piece there too, where it's like, I like, I love coaching. I love it. I have other strengths and I can get burnt out. And then it's like, oh, well, this thing that I love now, all of a sudden I'm starting to get burned out or it's just kind of this one thing. I don't have these other creative outlets in that same kind of vein. And so then it's all of a sudden it'll be like, I don't want to do that at all anymore. And then you're just kind of left with, with nothing. When I really love what you're saying, where it's like, there are a lot of different things you can do. And just even just being open to it, this that exploration of, you know, somebody suggests something and you're like, that's the thing. Not to Sorry, mention you can change how much time you're putting into your business at that point. So if you want to essentially retire, just weed off all of the active revenue streams and, and you already have all of these passive revenue streams you've built up that make plenty of money go travel, go do what you want to do in your retirement to that point. And if you ever decide to come out of retirement, just bring back the active revenue streams. <laughs> you know, you can play with it after they've all been stabilized, which is really nice. So when you look at this amazing portfolio of your businesses, what are you the most proud of? I think that I get the most excited about seeing the results in the people I've been working with because I've never been the person who needs to be famous. I've always liked to be the person that's behind the one in the spotlight. I will be in the spotlight if I have to be, but I do the best right behind them, like that secondhand man kind of thing. And so it correlates with my business as well because my most excited moments are when I see them actually implementing. Or even this morning, I got an email from my clients uh, or one of my clients and he had just landed a new public speaking uh, keynote session for Veterans Day and he's a veteran. And I was so freaking excited for him. And it's like that moment where there's a chance they might not need you anymore. That's what I love the most, which sounds counterintuitive. And and honestly, more often than not, they stick with you afterwards anyway, uh, because there's always more you can teach them or you can help them build up the same thing in a different you know format. But because you could you could literally do 20 businesses like this if you wanted to. It's just it's all leverage. That's the most exciting thing for me because I'm like a parent, you know, sending my kid off to college or something. <laughs> At the beginning, you mentioned that you know, the hardest person to lead is yourself. And so with that, what are some of your top self-leadership tips? Oh my gosh, this comes straight from John Maxwell is my number one hands down favorite. Have refueling stations where you work. It is the best resource you can ever do. I set mine up years ago, so I'm trying to think of how I went through it. My big thing are books, music, quotes. I love quotes and podcasts. So those are my four biggest refueling stations. And a refueling station simply means if you needed to take a five minute break from work or a 15 minute break from work, whatever time you had just to step away for a moment, what would renew you and refresh you and distract your brain and give it that time to heal 
just for a couple minutes before you go back to what you were doing. And it needs to be something that's positive, that gets you excited, something you love. And so another thing that I've done in the past is put an easel right next to my computer. And so all I have to do is turn to the side and just start painting. And I had a, my iPad on a stand right over here. And no joke, I was watching Bob Ross videos and doing this like in between meetings with clients. <laughs> And, and it felt amazing, you know, that was, I loved it. It just made me feel so good and it refreshed me and it got my brain away from work. And that leads into a whole lesson about strategic laziness, but you really have to have that intentional time away from your work or you get burnt out completely. And refueling stations, if you set them up very close to you within, you know, hands reach, then whenever you have a couple moments, whether it's a half hour or 45 minutes, or whether it's two minutes or five minutes, you have something there to refresh yourself throughout the day. I guess one of the other big tips for me is having a mentor or a coach. Because <laughs> it is impossible to see everything that you do. I talk about acting a lot because I just started learning how to do that. And I've just started taking lessons, so it's all brand new to me. And I get to implement a lot of this in learning how to act. But one of the big things that my acting coach told me to do is do a script, record yourself and watch yourself, just like with public speaking, right? Watch how you're presenting yourself, watch where your hands go, watch where your eyes go. How is your energy? You might feel, this is a big issue for me, especially with speaking is, I feel like I have a lot of energy, but I actually am like a level energy number three out of 10 or something for everybody else. And so I have to really work on getting my energy level up. And that is a perfect opportunity with a coach or a mentor, because instead of recording yourself and how you work and how you talk to people and how you think throughout the day, you have somebody that you can bounce that off of. They are your recording studio essentially. And so they can tell you, you know, what is this being perceived as? Or have you ever thought about this? Oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. Great idea, you know? Those are probably the two biggest things for me or the two things that have meant, made the most difference. I do, uh, in one of my workshops, I do talk about refueling stations nice. uh, because it's a leader self-care section of a series. And so we talk about that as just, we always have all these reasons why we can't. Mm -hmm. And when you have something that's just right there and it only takes a minute or a couple minutes, right? And then all of the mental health, physiological, calming your nervous system, all that sort of stuff, these benefits, obviously then lets you show up how you want to show up. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Especially when you have to rebalance yourself after a bad coaching session or something like that, or having to fire a client or, you know, or if you're in an employee job, having to fire an employee, that sucks. Even if you've done it a hundred times, it sucks, <laughs> you know, and it can, you're yeah. not able to control your emotions and, and be able to bring yourself in and out of negative and positive states, then you could be stuck in that negative state for the rest of the day until you go to bed. And then maybe you have bad dreams because of it. You don't sleep well, and then you get up on the wrong side of the bed because of it, and it goes into the next day, <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, so you mentioned this at the beginning, and then you mentioned it again now, and that is this idea of strategic laziness, which I love. So what does that mean, and what does that look like? So I'm still learning how to implement this in my life. I recently learned this uh, maybe four or five months ago from my coach or from Chloe Madonis, the person that put together the course that I took. And we get on weekly calls as a you know group of all of the enrollees and graduates. She's the one that taught us this. And I'm careful about who I teach this to because especially in my field, when you're working with an entrepreneur, most of the time that entrepreneur is is not being constructively active and so they might think they're busy but they're actually not or they might be consistently going through these patterns of talking themselves out of doing the things that they need to do and so then they distract themselves by cleaning the house or mowing the lawn instead of getting down to what they need to do and there's you know a lot of psychotherapy behind that but if you just look at those actions 
I wouldn't call it lazy, but it's it's not being successful. And so that kind of person, I most most likely I would not teach strategic laziness to them because they don't need to take more time off of their job or their work, right? They need to get more focused. <laughs> they need to learn how to be active and productive. And so you have to be very careful with this. So take it with a grain of salt. But strategic laziness is intentionally taking time off of work or off of what you consistently focus on. And this is right for those entrepreneurs like myself that get obsessive about what they do and succeed at everything they put their mind to because that's what their human needs, that's where their human needs are met. And so they feel the most accomplished and they feel the most valuable in life when they see results in their business. So they might be making a hundred or $500,000 a year or even a million dollars a year. They yeah. don't take time off of their business enough. And so they get satiated or they get burnt out or they get overwhelmed all the time. And that can lead to stagnation, if that's a word, being stagnant in their business and not having that growth in their business or not scaling in their business because they're so overwhelmed that, hey, maybe they used to love writing, but for some weird reason, every time you sit down to write, you get these emotions bottling up inside of you that make you feel horrible and you just have to get away, you know? And it's just, it's a horrible task, even though you absolutely loved it for five or seven years. Those would be good indications of when to start using strategic laziness. And so be very, very intentional about whether it's right for you or not. What I would suggest doing is, what are your favorite hobbies? Think about that first. Think about hobbies that you can do inside your house and outside. Think about hobbies you can do that are free and hobbies that are paid and start intentionally or very specifically scheduling them into your calendar on a regular basis every single week, scheduling a mixture of those into your calendar so that you are taking strategic laziness. You're strategically being lazy away from your job. <laughs> Our brains need it to reboot and to be able to heal up from all the work they've been doing. And so if you're running on empty and you're running on empty all the time, you're not going to have a good output. You're not gonna have great results in your life or whatever you're doing. But if you can take that moment to refresh and heal up and focus on something else, that strategic laziness is an extremely valuable item. A lot of times people who need strategic laziness also are burnt out in their hobbies as well. And so if you're like I was at that point, I would highly suggest starting something new like I just did with acting. So I can do acting in my house by myself or I can go and spend a few hundred dollars and take a class or some great workshop by you know, Emmy award-winning actors. Another strategic laziness hobby that I recently took up, I got those adult coloring books and I'll sit down and just color for a little while because it forces my brain to stop thinking. Anything that is about coloring or drawing or painting, even if you suck at it, it gives your brain a really big break because you don't have to think about something. With acting, I still have to think. I have to, you know, try to get better at something. So having things that use your brain in different facets or different levels is important too. When you talk about that too, it also reminds me, like I like to go like climbing, like bouldering mm -hmm. indoors where there's a pad if I fall. But I like that because I don't have to think that hard. Yeah. Just the next grip, the next grip, but I do have to focus enough to stay safe. <laughs> So I love that because whenever I'm within, you know, when I'm in a climbing facility, I'm never thinking about anything else. I'm mostly just thinking about like, trying not to fall, seems pretty survival-y, but you know, trying not to fall, but just kind of focus on that next step. But I don't need, I'm not overthinking about it. The yellow ones are the path, the red <laughs> ones are the path. It's not something crazy. And that's one thing I will say that is incredible about men is that they know how to do this very well. That's why a lot of times when you want to talk to a man or teach him something or get him to talk, like coach him on something and have him speak and answer questions, you should have him doing something like physically doing something. That's why golfing was such a big deal with executive coaches, because if men are physically doing something, they're not 
having to think that much. They're not overthinking. They're not trying to protect themselves as much. They're not trying to go through all these cultural things saying you can't be emotional. And women, it's so healthy for us to do that as well, but we are taught that we're supposed to be over multitasking and taking care of everything and keeping everybody on track and watching out for everything all at the same time. And so for women, especially, it's harder to be strategically lazy because we think that we're not supposed, we're not valuable if we aren't doing that. So that's something we could learn from the guys. I also really appreciated earlier when you brought up that you can think you're really busy, but are you actually being productive? You've definitely seen that a lot where people are like, I'm so busy, but there's no results. A lot of times they actually believe there's results. And so something I do with all of my private clients and something I'm putting into one of my courses is my scoreboard training. And my scoreboard training aligns all of their goals and their achievements or all of their goals to achievements they want, and then adding that into a calendar scoreboard, breaking it down by month, by week, by day, and just making sure that they know if they look at this scoreboard, they can see without any illusions whether they're doing well or whether they're, they need to pick up the pace. And that's the two biggest illusions I see entrepreneurs having. They either think they're doing better than they are, or they think doing think that they aren't as good as they actually are. And so the scoreboard fixes both of those. And it's so important. I make every single client do it. I love that so much. What advice would you offer a younger version of yourself just starting on their leadership journey? If you're just getting into leadership for whatever reason, you listen to one of my LinkedIn posts saying that leadership isn't just for the bosses and you're a solopreneur and you're finally thinking, hey, maybe I should try this thing out. Or if you're just got into your very per first leadership position and you don't want to be a bad boss, there, there are three things I would highly suggest doing. One is get a coach as fast as you can. And if you can't afford a coach, then get coached by people who have written books. And you can get audiobooks or you can read the old fashioned way, but start getting mentorship or coaching from somebody who is incredible at leadership. And don't just read it, implement. So read a chapter and then try to implement the next day at work. Read a chapter and then try and implement the next day at work, that kind of thing. The next thing I would highly suggest doing is working with an RMT coach or working on some of the bad patterns and habits that we build from our childhood because honestly 10 times out of 10 a lot of our non-successful patterns originated from our childhood and it's very rare when it originated after that we just a lot we just don't really remember when we're kids most of the times so we just think we've always been like this or you know, we think of the times that have triggered us since then in our adult life or as teenagers or something, but it actually started even further back. And so be very conscious about what patterns were created from childhood, because every time our brain creates these patterns or these belief systems about life, which are pretty much the same thing, our patterns come directly from our belief systems, our brains did that to keep us safe, to protect us from something. So it's a good thing that our brains were doing that. Don't be mad that you can't stay in a relationship past two months or something like that. Just understand that this no longer serves me because I don't have to be protected from this anymore. Yes, at one point in time, there was a reason for it, but I don't have to keep doing that. And this could potentially, more often than not, it will affect my growth as a leader. And so I would start working on that right away because it does take time. And the sooner you start fixing those things and retraining a lot of those habits and a lot of those triggering effects, the sooner that you'll be a better leader and be able to focus on other people more and it won't affect people negatively. And then the last thing I would suggest somebody do is to intentionally listen twice as much as you talk or 10 times as much as you talk. <laughs> so being a leader is not about telling people what to do. Yes, we do have to do that sometimes. Uh, you can't be all flowers and, and honey and candy to everybody all the time. There are points in time where you have to buckle down and do what 
people are not going to be happy with. And that's a, it's a very real part of leadership that quote unquote good leaders often forget. But that's more advanced leadership. We don't like to talk about that right away to new leaders just because it can mess things up or people can can use that before they're ready. And because we're we already think that leadership is about telling people what to do, it will more naturally over exaggerate that. But that goes back to listening. We need to listen to every single person below us and above us and not only listen to them, but clearly telling them and giving them the opportunities to speak. So a lot of times leaders don't do that for authority figures. They don't give room for people to speak. So whether it's from their childhood or whether it's from other past jobs, people oftentimes have learned not to speak up. Even if they've never worked with you before, they will carry that over into your leadership. So you need to be intentional about creating those moments for those people to tell you what they truly think without anything bad happening. And I do this a lot with, uh, I used to work with a lot of executive chairs from this um, private business club. And every single one that came on, I would do this with, and I would tell them to do it with their committee members, but I would specifically ask them, all right, out of what I just said, or what we just talked about, what don't you like? And out of all of this, what, what do you like? Some people I can just say, what do you think? And they'll start talking. But a lot of times if they uh, have the issues that I was talking about before where they've been trained not to speak up, they won't. So if nobody's ever taught them that it's okay, they won't. Or if they're introverts, <laughs> one of them was uh, in charge of a writer's club. And it was, you know, one of those introverts where you just had to constantly poke and prod to get to speak up. But eventually, he started feeling safe and comfortable and so he would speak a lot more often after i had worked with him on it but having those moments where it's okay for them to tell you that you suck that's that's the whole goal behind this give them the opportunity to tell the, to tell you that you suck <laughs> so that you can fix the stuff before it gets too bad <laughs> but those are the three big yes. tips i think do you have a book or a resource that you recommend to others? For new leaders, I will always go to Developing the Leader Within You 2.0. Leaders Eat Last is also really good. I think a lot of my books are either John Maxwell or Simon Sinek, most likely, or Brene Brown, of course. I love all of her books. <laughs> so any of those resources you won't go wrong with or podcasts like this one. Thank you. You do all these amazing things. How can people find you? Yeah, so most of my work has always been in private networks. And so I haven't used social media a whole lot up until recently. So I do have Facebook and you can find me there with my name, Sharice Kroll. But a lot of my free training and a lot of my focus the last couple of weeks and will be for the next few years is going to be solely on LinkedIn. And as we know, LinkedIn business pages aren't really a thing, but it's our personal pages that the algorithm works with. And so that's where I post all of my information. This has been amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been absolutely incredible. And it's been too long coming. We shouldn't wait this long next time, okay? <laughs> Thank you for listening to today's episode. The podcast is going to take a break and we are moving to YouTube. You can find me there at Natasha Cheyenne, N-A-T-A-S-H-A-S-H-E-Y-E-N-N-E, -E -E, where you can find all past episodes of the podcast. I am also working on other new stuff for leaders like workshops, frameworks to help leaders lead, reflections, book reviews, and leadership studies on people from history and even situations from movies and TV shows. I look forward to seeing you over there.